Thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, thanks particularly to all who came because I asked. Special thanks to my colleagues at McMillan, Aaron Allison and Bill, thanks for all the hard work. This is the Penn Dinner, so tonight I thought I'd speak briefly about the importance of the First Amendment. Uh, for those of you who have made, uh, for those of us who have, who have to make significant decisions on First Amendment issues, our cho choices are, by necessity, personal. There is little guidance, and the obligation to follow the amendment is only moral. There is no law to bind us. As publishing becomes more consolidated, and as the retailing of books becomes more consolidated, there are fewer and fewer of us who decide on what to publish or not to publish, or very occasionally what book to pull. We make as individuals each of these decisions, one of us distinct from the other. I come from a family of book publishers and booksellers, but I grew up on a cattle ranch, one small dot of blue in the vast sea of red that is the Rocky Mountain West. Where I grew up, we had no TV, and the single radio station played the Star Spangled Banner every day at noon. I rooted hard for Smoking Joe Frazier to beat the gifted Muhammad Ali. And as Vietnam raged, the only question I struggled with was, should I join the Army or the Marines? I admired self-reliance, I admired loyalty, and I admired courage. In my late 30s, I was offered a job running St. Martin's Press. I remember thinking about the First Amendment responsibilities that came with the job. I recalled how demoralized I'd been at Simon & Schuster when the corporate guys pulled American Psycho. And I remembered the great respect I felt when Salman Rushdie and Viking Penguin withstood the onslaught over the satanic verses. I, I, think I, saw, I think I saw him tonight. I think he's over there. Thank you, Salman. In, Intellectually, I considered the possibility of prison or worse, so I got myself a copy of the First Amendment, a copy that still sits on my desk drawer today. Oddly, the words are not very helpful. The bid on freedom of speech in the press goes like this. Congress shall, not, shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. That's it. It is a mandate to Congress, but imposes no legal obligation on publishers, writers, or journalists. It doesn't even define freedom of speech. It simply says Congress can't abridge it. It was only in the early 1800s that the Supreme Court decided it would be up to the courts to interpret the Constitution. Then, in the case of an anti-draft document circulated in World War I, the court, in defense of a socialist, defined the clear and present standard clear and present danger standard for free speech. In a KKK case in 1969, it refined the standard. The court found that speech should be protected unless advocacy is direct, directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action. The court also held that it is unconstitutional to impose a heckler's veto. To quote the New York Times, the Supreme Court concluded that the government's responsible in in these circumstances is to control those who threaten violence rather than to sacrifice the speaker's First Amendment rights. Or as Justice Brandeis wrote, those who won our independence were committed to, good pr to the, the principle that the fitting remedy for evil counsels are good ones. We stand now at a difficult moment. There is a new generation with different sensibilities. There is both a heightened sensitivity and heightened bellicosity. Even after the famed Skokie decision that allowed Nazis to march, there is a feeling that any form of hate should not be published and that authors who offend our common standards, decency, should not be offered a platform. There is a steady drumbeat asserting that lines should be drawn, that the rising incivility from one side or the other should not be given a megaphone. I see this argument and emotionally, I agree with it. The last thing I want to do is empower those who would tear down their opponents with deplorable language and behavior, particularly if those they are tearing down share my point of view. 
But unfortunately, the very act of drawing a line and making that decision runs counter to our obligations to defend free speech. It also runs afoul of the belief that in a free society, it is always better to expose than to censure. We have no responsibility to publish any single book, we as publishers. It is easy and fulfilling to publish books that bolster our own beliefs. It is also easy to say that anyone can self-publish a book these days, so we don't have to worry about their views reaching the public. Someone else will take care of that. It is easy to feel safe, and it's easy to be safe. But as we face these decisions, I hope we will decide to stand for what is right, not for what is easy. I hope we will apply principles of the First Amendment and have the courage to resist the great power of polarizing opinion. I hope we are brave, and I hope to be brave. Oleg Sensov, who we honor tonight, has certainly shown the way, as has Penn in the work they do every day of every year. Thank you very much.